Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. This is a speaker meeting, so tonight Liz will speak for 10 minutes and then turn the meeting over to our main person, our main speaker, Brandon, who will share his experience, strength, and hope. Yay. So, okay. Liz, it's all you. This feels really official here. I'm Liz. I'm an alcoholic. Um, thank you, Guillermo, for asking me to speak. Um, I am really tired and nervous at the same time, which is a really fun feeling. Um, So I'm just going to briefly tell you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, My sobriety date is October 27, 2002. Um, I was born in Berkeley, but grew up in a really small town in Sonoma County, Forestville. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. Yeah. Um, And there wasn't much to do there. Um, So I got into a lot of trouble. Um, I come from a family with a lot of problem drinkers. Um, I'm not going to say if they're alcoholics or not. Some of them have identified as alcoholics at different points, but nobody's sober. Um, And an example of, like, the culture of my family is that um, my grandmother, who is turning 80 this month, she loves drinking And um, she had quadruple bypass surgery, and they told her she couldn't drink anymore. And she's like, nope, that was 15 years ago. She's been drinking. She's okay. Um, But I go to her house usually like at least once a month or something, and she knows I'm sober. She knows I'm in AA. Um, And I'll show up with my brothers who drink, and she'll immediately ask if everybody wants to like do a shot or whatever. And she always like feels the need to pour me like a little shot of water for some reason. I'm like, Mima, I I don't care. Like you guys can do the shots without me. I don't even doesn't bother me. Luckily, at this point in my sobriety, I think when I was newly sober, that probably you know would have definitely bothered me. But anyway, that's just like how I grew up. A lot of partying, a lot of drinking. And um, so when I first started drinking and using, I really thought like, yeah, this is like what people do. This is how people have fun. And I started like drinking and smoking weed when I was in high school. And that was what people were doing. Um, And so when I was in high school, I started out, I always used soccer as like my timeline of like what it was like, what happened and what it's like now. Because I was like a really big soccer player. Um, and when I was a freshman, I like made varsity and I made all league and I had all this promise and whatever. And that was like really before I started like drinking and smoking. And, um, and then I started partying and hanging out with older people. I got a job as like a bus girl at this Greek restaurant. And there was this guy there who was, um, I had a crush on him and, um, he was actually in jail at the time, but he was out on work furlough. And, um, so we would like make out at work, like in the parking lot or in the walk-in fridge or whatever. And, um, so I was like hanging out with him, like at work and, um, yeah, I mean, he was like 28 and I was 16 or something, but, um, Then my stepdad, who was a sergeant at the Sonoma County Jail, um, got, like, a call from my friend's mom and said, like, oh, do you know, like, your daughter is hanging out with this guy? Like, this is his name. And, of course, they looked it up, and he was, like, a registered sex offender. And, like, it was just so bad. So this is, like, who I was rolling with. I was, like, 16, and I was, like, playing soccer. So there's, like, a real transition that happened happened here. Um, so then, um, I started like dabbling with harder drugs and drinking more often and drinking like on school days. And, um, I went to soccer practice and I was like on acid and I still (laughs) made the team, but like, um, I sat the bench that whole year and I think I pretty much made the team because they were like, oh, my God, like, she had been so good and she contributed so much to the team. We should just, like, let her stay or whatever. 
So um, that was kind of like the consequences that I was having even at that like early um, point in my drinking. And a lot of my friends, like I still have all my high school yearbooks, and a lot of my friends wrote in like my senior year um, yearbook, like, oh my God, you've changed so much. Like, we can't even believe how much you've changed. That was like what everybody wrote. And I was just like, whatever. Like, um, so everybody kind of like graduated from high school and moved away and like went to college and everything. And I just stayed around and, um, I started hanging out more and more with this guy who was like, he got out of jail and he had a bunch of friends and we all would like party together all the time. And I loved hanging out with them because, um, we would drink all night and then wake up and like drink all day. And most of my high school friends, nobody did that. And so I really felt like, oh my God, like these are my people. They're so fun. Like, but they were all still surprisingly like pretty functional. They could like get up and go to work if they needed to. And I think in a lot of ways I'm lucky because I could not do that. Like I would drink and I just could not show up to work. Like I didn't get fired very often because I would just stop showing up and it would just be like, I knew obviously after like a week of not showing up that I was fired or I quit or something. Um, so that was like how I left all my jobs before sobriety. Um, so I think that that made it easier for me to see that I had a problem and see that I needed to get sober. Um, the last like big drinking story, I guess I'll tell you is that just a progression is that after I graduated high school, my dad who played soccer was like, you should come play on our team. Like, um, they're really excited to have you. We know, you know, you were such a star player and all this, which you know where this is going. Um, the night before the game, when I was supposed to join them on the team, I like stayed up all night. I was drinking, doing speed and like doing heroin. And I showed up and I had like no sleep at all. And I showed up to play and was just like barfing all over the field. And like, I couldn't play at all. And finally I just like walked off and like never, came back or whatever um so um at some point like I realized I think that it wasn't all fun and games and like this wasn't normal and um I had a moment of clarity I was like staying on a friend's like love seat and not even a couch but it was in like a bar a renovated barn and like there were bats flying in and out of this barn I was like hiding under a blanket like because I thought the bats were gonna bite me or something and I just felt like this is not like the fun story that I've been telling myself like I really did think like this is an alternative lifestyle it's like people just don't know like we stay up all night and like I don't know what I thought we were doing but like playing music like renovating rooms like I don't even know what we're doing but we're really creative I felt and um so anyway I think I really saw my life for what it was which was like I had not left this tiny town that I grew up in I had all these dreams of stuff that I wanted to do and I hadn't done anything I couldn't even keep a job like at this point I was still trying to get like waitressing jobs and I was showing up late to the interview and I remember I was like 18 or I guess I was probably 19 at this point and they were like, oh, like, do you know about wines? And I was like, not really, but I love drinking wine or something. <laughs> and then, like, I was like, oh, my God. Even, like, in that state, I was kind of like, that's probably not a good thing to say when you're, like, 19 and you're not even supposed to be drinking. Like, so thing, I guess I was, like, getting little glimpses of, like, reality. Um, so I remember calling my mom, and I was still covered under her insurance, um, and I was trying to like go to the junior college at this time. And I kept, I start out really strong and then I drop out of all the classes. Um, so I went to rehab and, um, I remember when I walked in, I felt like, oh my God, like I've really fucked up now. Now I've like admitted I had a problem. I'm in rehab. I can't like get out of here without everybody knowing, um, and, like, people had tried to have interventions with me, like, um, when I was in school, like, teachers and my parents, and I was just, like, I never admitted anything, and so this was, like, a big turning point. Um, so, basically, what I got out of rehab was, like, go to AA. Um, so, I got out of rehab, and um, I really wanted to be sober at this point. Like, I think when I first went in, I really was... Um, 
just thinking about like quitting all the hard drugs, but I was still going to drink and I had anxiety. So I was going to keep taking Xanax and all this other stuff that I had prescriptions for. And, um, and then it really did become clear to me that like, you know, I couldn't just do one of these things and not the other. They were all, for me, they're all really linked together. So I got out of rehab. Oh, I met a guy in rehab and we were together, <laughs> um, for a while, like a couple of years. And, um, he was a really hardcore addict and alcoholic also. So I definitely did not follow all the rules. Um, and I did relapse a few times. Um, but I moved to Marin and I moved into a halfway house and, um, you know, they wanted you to get a sponsor and I was so shy. I didn't want to talk to anybody. So I went to meetings every day, but I didn't talk to anyone except for like my boyfriend. And, um, there was this board in the house where you had to write like your sponsor's name and what step you're on and all this. And so I wrote the name Mariposa on the board as my sponsor. And they were all like, we don't know who Mariposa is. I was like, she lives in San Francisco. And they were like, okay. So I relapsed, obviously. Um, and. And I, when I came back, I thought, okay, like I'll try to get a sponsor this time. Like I had like a little bit more willingness. And, um, so I just asked the first woman that gave me her number cause I was now raising my hand as a newcomer and she was my sponsor for almost 10 years. So it's so great. I feel like sometimes you can like, especially when you get more time, just like overthink, like who's going to be my sponsor. They have to have this, this, and this. And like, I swear, I mean, I didn't know this woman at all. I just call, I didn't even remember what she looked like when I called her and she really did so much for me. Um, so that was like one turning point, but I still was so shy and I didn't want to reach out to any women in AA. Um, and I was working the steps at this time, but I just really was not willing to like build any support group or ask for help. Um, so I relapsed again, just like another one night situation. And that time when I came back, I really felt like, okay, I'm going to just do everything they say and just see what happens. And I have been sober ever since. So it was not like easy in the beginning. If you're new, um, I felt so uncomfortable in my own skin. I, um, had gained like 30 pounds in rehab in 28 days and like none of my clothes fit. And like, I didn't know what kind of music to listen to because all my old music, like reminded me of drinking and using, I had no friends. I didn't know anything about myself and it was just brutal, but it also was really like exciting and, I look back on that time so fondly, which is surprising, but, um, but it does get easier. I think like I felt so uncomfortable, even like going to the bank or talking to my mom, just like really basic life moments. I felt so uncomfortable and it just really isn't like that today. So if you feel like that, like it does get better. Um, and now I've been sober for a while and I still love AA way more than I did when I first came in. Actually, I did not like AA when I first came in. Um, and I definitely didn't feel like I belonged in AA and now I do. Um, I still have a sponsor and, um, I'm working the steps. I have some sponsees and like sobriety is not easy, but it's so amazing. And I really feel that like everything I have in my life today is from AA, like AA taught me how to show up. Like I said, I couldn't even show up to work. Um, and even early in sobriety, I really felt like I could call in and just be like, I'm too tired. I'm not going to come in for another hour or something. And like, you know, I think showing up to meetings really taught me like, yeah, you just show up even when you don't want to. And like, that is when the magic happens. So I'm so grateful you guys are here. Thank you so much. I'm going to stand up, too, because uh, the other thing about restless, irritable, and discontent, right? I'm still restless, <laughs> less irritable, and less discontent in my life. Uh, my name's Brennan. I am an alcoholic. Hi, Brennan. Uh, thank you for your lead. That's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have uh, a couple different perspectives on sobriety. Welcome to you guys uh, who, are, who are new, uh, checking out the program. If you're here, um, you know, I, mean, I can say it is the best thing going. It's absolutely the best thing going. I owe my life to AA, um, even though I didn't know I particularly needed 
AA when I came in. I didn't particularly like you guys. I didn't particularly want to like you guys. A lot of days I still don't want to like you guys. Um, and you say, that's cool. That's fine. That's great. See where it takes you. Um, and that's been my experience, you know, is, is AA is a program. Uh, for me, it's conditional, right? Like, it's a 12-step program right there. It says so on the wall. Um, and if I'm not working those 12 steps, then I'm not actually in the program. That was what was told to me when I came in, and that's the way I've lived it. Um, I got sober uh, January 18th, 1998. Martin Luther King Day. Good day to get sober, right? Um, uh, I got sober. I've been sober since my first meeting. Um, despite myself, I don't say that because I've got things figured out. Um, but I have, when I came in, I was done. You know, it's like, um, you know, I had the bats flying without actually, you know, having the bats flying. I, I just was done with, with alcohol. Um, I have three sponsees right now. Um, I have a sponsor, Bill. Um, I don't call him as much as I should. I'm working uh, step four right now. I don't have a service commitment. My home group uh, meets tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, House Street. She'll be there. Maxwell will be there. Everybody's invited. Um, thank you for asking me to speak. Yomo goes uh, to the 9 o'clock meeting as well. So that's the, the basics. Um, as I say, I got uh, I got sober, and I still don't understand how I got sober. You know, like nobody in my family um, has, at the time had, 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 was in AA. None of my friends. There was no fiery showdown with like a boss or a girlfriend or like me screaming and them saying, you know, you're going to rehab. Or, I didn't go to rehab, right? I just went to my first meeting and uh, uh, the guy said, look, if you want to stop drinking, this is the place to do it. And that was true for me. Um, it was absolutely empirically true. Um, and it was powerful because uh, I thought I was just, you know, I thought I was just going to bring myself stupid every day because that's pretty much what I did. Um, first time I got drunk, I was 13 years old, um, and I remember it, um, probably a lot of us either, I think it's kind of binary, you either absolutely remember your first drunk, or you're like, yeah, I mixed a bunch of stuff from my parents and vomited everywhere, um, but I remember my first drunk, um, I have an older brother who I love, I'm very close to him, um, saw him this morning, as a matter of fact, uh, and we used to go over to Chris Tilton's house, and, uh, his mom would work during the days, and we would move his mom's in the living room, we'd move everything out of the living room, and we'd put on the Sugar Ray Leonard gloves, and we'd do boxing matches. And I mean, like, look at me, I'm strong. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm a really competitive guy. Um, I raced my bike this morning, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I, I live, I mean, you give me, you know, you want to play hoop? Great, let's do it. You know, you want to play ball? Great, let's, let's do it. Um, but so I get, you know, and I get in there, and I, they just pound the shit out of me. Right? And I was like, whoa, 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 I'm still getting beat on, I'm still getting beat on. Um, but I'm not dead, you know, I'm like, I'm still, and they were just pounding on me, having fun, just beating the little guy, and, uh, and it wasn't a lot of fun for me, um, but it was fun when, like, I got to do that. And suddenly, like, like, I wasn't afraid anymore, you know what I mean? Put that drink down, and I was like, something happened. And I think it's something happens to a certain class of people. You know, Big Book talks about it. And I wasn't afraid anymore. Is that all you got? Like, is that all you got? You know, my head sideways. I can't lift my left arm. You know, I'm like bloody. But is that all you got? You know, and that is kind of like you know Michael Urban. Don't you know who I am? You know, is that all you got? And and they would just pound me more. But I didn't feel it. And I didn't care. And I loved it because I didn't. I didn't particularly want to care. So that's growing up for me. Um, I have great parents who I love. I never told them I loved them. Didn't understand about how to even say that word, like love, what it means. Um, that's changed. That's changed a lot. So go through school. Uh, man, breeze right through school. You know, do okay. Um, I come from an academic family. Got through. Um, <clears throat> Started, uh, went overseas, uh, started going to school in, in Dublin uh, for a few years, uh, for, well, in high school, I was going to school in Dublin. Uh, graduated early, got out, um, you know, just set myself up to get back to Europe because I was going to live the grand adventure. Crap away. Adventure. I was thinking big already, you know, I'm like 18 years old, and I'm done with all you guys because I'm different, and I'm going to go over here and be really cool in Europe. And be really different, and you know, like you were saying, like you know, I'm just gonna—I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna I didn't renovate any houses or anything like that, or renovate any rooms, but I was dark and gloomy, and I had my moods, and you know, and I, 
I was just living the living the dream, right? And I'm going to school in, in uh, I'm going to school in Belfast at this time. Um, you know, shooting dope with a girl from Berlin. It's great. It's like wow, <laughs> wow. You don't have a shirt on. That is even cooler. Like, sure, let's shoot up. Like, what the fuck am I doing here? But let's do it. Yeah, of course. So, you know, all this stuff starts happening, and I'm just sitting there, like, yeah, I'm along for the ride. This is great. It all goes into the grand adventure. Um, so, you know, it's all fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, come back to the States, check in, like nothing's happening here. Uh, so I moved to Prague, right? Like like we do. Um, so this is uh, 1991, I guess. Yeah, 90, 1991, somewhere in there. Moved to Prague. Um, and, you know, living the dream, right? Like cold water flat, squatting, the whole thing. Um, me and 16 other people in one apartment. Um, it, was, it was grim. It was really, I mean, looking back, I'm like, wow, you are just foul and filthy. Um, but, you know, I mean, it didn't matter, right? Because it was all part of this image that I had of how I was, how my life was going to go, what I looked like. And, and, uh, and most importantly, you know, like, what other people think about me. You know, like, what? I'm cool, right? Like, I'm cool because I'm in Prague. I'm really cool because I'm doing these things. And, like, wasn't that crazy when we jumped off the bridge into the river? That was just that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Let's keep it rolling. Um, so Prague did a lot of damage. Um, moved to Vienna. It was time to grow up now. I don't know what, I don't know what sort of arbitrary, like, thing decided. I, I was time to grow up, so I went to Vienna, which, you know, I mean, it, it's about, it, it's still in sort of in the, like, 1800s back in, in Vienna. I say that affectionately. I love the city, but... Um, <laughs> So I'm in Vienna and um, living with a wonderful woman, uh, Italian woman, just dynamite. Just, we were, she was great. She was great. Um, I started doing something I hadn't done before, which was I started hiding stuff. I don't know if anybody else did that. Probably not. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure nobody ever like because she was a really good woman. She was like, <clears throat> she was a good woman, and uh, it just killed me to just be the shady dog that I was and. I mean, I was just slinky. I was just like, I didn't, you know, and I just didn't feel good. And I was, you know, she treated me really well, and I treated her terribly. It's a long shot. It's a long story. Um, but as part of this growing up business, because it was time to get my affairs in order. Oh, I forgot one thing. So in Prague, uh, I contracted some crazy disease, spent a month in the hospital. Uh, I hadn't talked to my parents at this time. <laughs> I hadn't talked to my parents in about four years. Called them from the ICU and said, "Hey, I, I'm not getting any better. I think I better come home." You know, and they're like, "Yeah, you better come home." So I fly home from from Prague. Um, at this time, my, my folks were living in Kansas, um, and uh, I, I get off the uh, airplane. I can't walk, so the guys are like wheelchairing me out. And I'm just, I, I've got, you know, of course, I had a couple pops on the on the flight home. It's a long flight. Uh, in my defense, and, and, and I'm still like, I got this kind of smirk on my face, and I'm thinking like, oh, I'm such a great guy, I'm just, I'm just like, I got it rolling, you know, and like, I get out there, and I'm, I, even now, I mean, this is 20 plus years later, I can still see my parents' face, and my mom was crying, I've never, my mom was a hard farm woman, like, she's a hard farm woman, her mom was a uh, school teacher in a single, single, um, doing school, tough women, and she was crying. I had never seen my mom cry. But she was crying because I was a jackass. You know? And it didn't hit me at the time, right? So I get off the plane, I'm still living the grand adventure, and I'm starting to realize, oh, wow, consequences. Wait a minute. I, didn't, I don't mean to cause you guys any problems, but I'm just doing my thing. And they're like, yeah, you are. Um, you should call us. Let us know you're alive. Yeah, but I, I, I meant to, but, you know, the phones and all this, and, and the point of fact is I just, you know, I couldn't be bothered. It was a lot of my life. I just couldn't be bothered. Uh, while I'm home, I decide to take a road trip, of course, go out to see my best friend out in Santa Barbara. Um, while I'm out there partying, um, uh, my grandfather, my dad's dad dies. Can't be bothered to go to the funeral. You know, just can't, just can't be bothered. Because um, I'm rolling. I'm rolling, man. I'm rolling downhill. I don't realize at the time, but um, I'm rolling downhill. So go back. All right. All that's weighing on me pretty heavy. Go move to Vienna. Time to grow up. Time to get my shit together. Like, 
I start buying shirts with buttons on them. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Like, I'm not conning anybody, right? Um, and to put a point on that, so I fly up to I fly up to uh, Berlin. Big, important interview. Big job. Put me on the map. I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, finance guy in Berlin. So I get up there, have a couple of drinks on the flight, as we do. You know, so I'm getting there. We go out to lunch. I get hammered. And the guy says to me, he says, like, we're not going to offer you a job, but we might suggest you go to rehab. <laughs> I'm like, so when do I start? I, like, when do I start? He says, like, um, you don't seem to understand here. You, you like, we can't hire gun people. Like, not who are going to, like, drink and do, you know, stuff like you do. Um, so I go back to, I go back to Vienna. Um, two weeks later, I fly back to the States. You know, because they didn't understand me. And it was all going to be different when I got back here, right? Because you're my people, I speak the language, I got all the, you know, it's my native tongue, I understand all the cultural references, all the nuances, everything's going to be different. Um, you know, and I'm certainly going to be able to put my stuff together, wear button-up shirts and, you know, take over the world, pretty much. Because um, I'm a great guy. And so, I, I, you know, I come back, um, and it's worse. This feeling inside of me is worse. Right? I mean, it's just, and I thought I was going to leave it in Europe. I didn't think it was going to, like, actually, you know, I certainly didn't plan to pack it. I didn't make room in my luggage for, like, oh, just dump a bunch of icky shit in there. Make sure and bring it home with you because you want to have it with you. But it made its way back with me. And um, so I started to get pretty desperate. I started to get really desperate. And I started doing stuff I, you know, again, started, you know, like, said I'd never do. Never, never do these things. And here I am doing them. And at the time, so this is, you know, sort of summer, early fall, 2000, uh, 1997, I had a scare with cancer. Um, and I mean, that's, I don't, you know, I don't want to be like really dramatic about it, but it was, you know, it was, I had to have surgery. Um, if you guys know what Lance Armstrong, that kind of cancer, that was my kind of cancer. Uh, <laughs> so it was, it was intimate. Uh, uh, and it's, aside from being really painful, um, aside from being really, really painful, um, and, and, you know, I wrapped up a lot of other stuff in there, but, but aside from being really painful, um, it also got me thinking about, like, actually dying. Like, and I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I didn't walk around like going, oh my God, I'm going to die. And I'm not going to, I'm not, I mean, I'm dramatic, but I'm not that dramatic. Um, but it actually got me to think about like, wow, like everything I've done has been kind of a sham. You know, like this is it. Like I get a nut chopped off and like, that's it. Like, sorry, sorry. <laughs> should have said that. <laughs> that a little bit better. So, you know, like this is the end. Like I'm like. Really? Like, that's it? And, like, I did all this stuff I don't really remember, and I kind of hurt a lot of people, and I don't really have much to show for my life. I didn't start out in life to end up feeling like this, you know? And so I was pretty, pretty desperate, right? I was pretty desperate. And, and you know, as I mentioned, it was pretty painful. <laughs> um, so they gave me some uh, painkillers, and... Um, which is something I've never taken, believe it or not. Like, I, I was kind of garbage guy. I was like, oh, sure, this will goof me up. Great. Um, love the speed, though, as you might tell. I'm kind of kinetic. <laughs> so, and this is me. I'm wired. This is me at, you know, 830 or whatever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, put some, yeah, anyway. Um, so, um, so I started taking painkillers. And the great thing about them, I found, and maybe you guys know this, I didn't, because, again, I didn't take them. It wasn't my experience. Um, but they go with everything. <laughs> like, they go with, I mean, beer, okay, vodka, great, whiskey, cool. Like, wow, oh, man, I think I've got something going here. And uh, and so, you know, and, and my doctor, you know, all I had to do was just kind of go like, you know, like, oh, and, like it's, you know, okay, it's great, yeah. And so, um, so this kind of like, you know, acceleration down. Like, this just sped me down um, to the point where, like, I was having regular blackouts. And at the time, I lived down on Lake on Lake Shore. And uh, I was coming out of blackouts, mm -hmm. walking on my roof, doing stuff like this. <laughs> you know, like, because I'm, and 
And I look around, I'm going like, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> what, what am I doing here? You know? Um, Guillermo knows, like, I, I, I ride my bike everywhere. I race my bike. I, I ride it. I'm, I shouldn't be behind a car. I drove here tonight. I shouldn't be. There's people who shouldn't drive, and there's people who shouldn't drive. I'm one of the ones who shouldn't drive. Um, also, it's handy because you don't get to UIs. Uh, um, wasn't my experience anyway. Um, and I started losing bikes. You know, like, I'd ride to the bar. And I, you know, forget to lock my bike, or I'd leave it somewhere, and I wouldn't know where it is. And like bikes to me are, are important. I got five of them, and I love them like my daughter. I really do. I love my bike. Um, but uh, I was starting to lose my bikes, having blackouts. Um, I was working downtown at the time, and I was starting to have these uncontrollable crying jags. Like, I'd be on barge sweeping, like, like literally, and I, I work market hours, so 5.30 in the morning, I'm riding, 5 o'clock in the morning, I'm on bar, you know, riding there, and I'm just, <laughs> and I mean, you know, there's only a few of us on there, and there's a lot of guys like me, and there's some other guys who are going to be like me, and there's some other guys who were like me, who now got their shit together, and, but anyway, I'm, I'm having breakdowns all the time, I'm uh, punching holes in walls just randomly. I just don't know what to do with myself. It's all falling to pieces. Um, and so this lasts for about four months. And let me just say, you know, you, you probably all have that, that last little time, whenever, wherever it is, whenever it is, that last little time when you realize, like, you were surfing the drain, and now the revolutions are getting tighter, and you're going quicker, and you're going down. And uh, I was in that vortex. I was dropping off the bottom. And so it's... It's Martin Luther King Day. I'm like, oh, wake up in my apartment. There's blood everywhere. I'm like, what the, what the, ooh, uh, I don't even know what. what I'm like, oh, man, must have gotten a fight or something. <clears throat> Hands are all torn up. No, those are, that's road rash. I fell last night on the bike. Okay. All right. Oh, my God, I got to get to work. Let's get, get, oh, man, I'm already late. What should I do? Should I call and lie? What should I, you know, yeah, I'm at the bar state. I mean, it's like the sun's already up. Like, I'm late. Um, and then I realized, oh, it's Martin Luther King Day. Markets are closed. I don't have to go to work today. Cool. What am I going to do? Well, so I walk into, as we do, walk into the free, uh, my refrigerator, so my kitchen. I walk in there, and, um, and I'm reaching for my uh, freezer to get my bottle locked out, right? Because that's breakfast. So I'm reaching there, and somehow my hand misses the door for the freezer, for the top and bottom, and it lands on the telephone up above, which is weird. Right? So it goes, ooh, and I got a cell phone in my hand. And even stranger, I pick it up, and I look in yellow pages, which the telephone was sitting on, uh, and I find, hey, hey, what the hell just happened? Like, as I say, nobody in my family, none of my friends, Nobody. I didn't even know about AA. But so, I call and I say, <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is, oh, uh, well, I'm, uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I think I might have a drinking problem, you know, because I, I thought, like, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know what, I, as I say, I don't know anything about this. I don't know any rehab. I don't know the language. I don't even know what you guys, 12 steps, never even heard of them. Um, but I had that moment of grace, you know, and so I, I picked up the phone and I don't know how I did it, why I did it, or what I did. I stopped thinking about it. I just got, I was like, God's get out of free, I get out of jail free card. He just threw it to me and said, this is your one shot, kid. If you're smart, you'll take it. And I was, okay. And so I called and I said, yeah, I think, uh, I think I have a drink problem and I'm going to die. Because <laughs> again, I'm dramatic, right? And this sweet woman, she's probably, I don't I never even met her, but she saved my life. Um, well, honey, before you die, why don't you come down to the meeting? Because <laughs> she's probably dealt with people like me before, right? But I, I had never dealt with people like her before, and I never dealt with people like you before. She said, there's a meeting at Central Office, 29 Penn Tully, the old Central Office, uh, at noon. Do you think you can get there? And I said, yeah, I can have my bike over there. I can make it. Oh, I lost my bike last night. Damn. I can walk over there. I'll, I'll be there. Um, so that was my first meeting, you know? And my first meeting was 
Let me just, just, sorry in the back, you can't see this, but this is me at my first meeting. I sit down, I start shuffling my feet, and I start crying. <laughs> and by the end of the meeting, there's like this, this sort of like Lake Shasta side <laughs> reservoir of tears, because it just started coming out of me. And I mean, I was just, I was embarrassing. I mean, I was embarrassing even to me, and that says something, but I was just, oh. I didn't hear a single word. They passed the basket, and it like made a big bump around me. I was afraid about getting their money wet. I mean, it was bad. So I'm just sitting there. <laughs> You know, and I'm just crying and shuffling my feet because I didn't know what else to do, right? Um, and I did that for about three or four meetings. Um, I would say I got sober on a Monday. Um, by Sunday, I was pretty crispy. I don't know if anybody else has felt that way. When you're sober and you don't have a program, and you're kind of walking around, or at least I, I walk around like this, and my wife says, wow, you're setting your jaw. I'm like, I'm ready to do battle. Like, I'm I, I like, wow, how did that happen? And so, you know, and people would come up and go like, hey, Liz, how's it going? Oh, it's going great. Fuck it up. I mean, it's so good. If it gets any better, I'm going to die. This is great. I would so much rather be feeling this way than just have a nice, good, oh, God, blessed, you know, drink of vodka right now. Yeah, this is great. This is great. Uh, so Sunday night, um, again, I'm just hanging on, like, Literally, like, uh, I mean, I, you know, I still haven't really even understood. You guys <coughs> talk some mother language that I just didn't understand at the time. Because um, I'm a little jittery and I'm a little shaky. And as I say, I weep a lot. Or at least I do, used to weep a lot. Um, uh, and uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm there. And Sunday night, the guy says to me, um, who's your spouse? And, uh, and I say... Uh, I don't have one. And the guy says, he's your sponsor. This is five days in, and my sponsor, uh, the guy who got me sober, the guy who's in, got his third strike. That happens. Um, but he, uh, he, he gave me the big book, and uh, we worked the steps. I started, I did my, my first, uh, I did my first four step, twenty some days sober. That was my experience, right? Um, so I'm making amends. Probably, you know, forty days sober. Um, you know, I was in the program. I didn't have any reservations about not drinking. I had lots of reservations about you guys. <laughs> I still do. Um, I had lots of reservations <laughs> about the steps. I had lots of reservations about this. But this was my only alternative, right? I couldn't stay sober any other way, right? And I knew I needed to stay sober. I had to stay sober. Um, because I couldn't go back to what I was doing. Because if I went back, I was, you know, taking the desperation and I was going to just, I was going to end it. I just couldn't do it any longer. It was just too painful. So my sponsor said, great, there's a program of action. So we got into the steps. We got to, to the, as I say, the first three, first four steps right away. Um, I sat up on the hill over the cemetery up in Oakland. Um, uh, I told them all this really, really important stuff, really important stuff. Like I prefaced everything by saying like, okay, so this is, this is a good one. Um, and he says, okay, now go ahead. Like, just read me your list. <laughs> and I started to get this, this, this inkling, this just vague idea that like, maybe I wasn't so important. And maybe, maybe I wasn't so important. Um, and that has served me pretty well, um, throughout sobriety. And so we started working the steps, um, and I got a service commitment right away. As I say, I don't have one right now. Um, I, I have three sponsees who I work with pretty, you know, pretty regularly. Um, I, I, I do stay involved in the program. Um, and I have to say, I mean, the program, I have yet, you know, in 18 years to kind of come across something that isn't really shored up in the program. And what I love and what I still remember, anytime I talk about, like, early sobriety, um, I always think about the doctor's opinion, right? And I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't go to a meeting. I hate these things. Um, 
but I can't go to a meeting without reading something. Um, and I love the doctor's opinion because it introduced that idea for me anyway. I read the, the first time I read the doctor's opinion was at the coffee mill down on uh, Lakeshore or on Grand, I guess it is. Um, and I went there just to show what a knucklehead I am. I went there really worried about because my sponsor said, "Okay, cool, we'll meet at the coffee mill." And I said, "Okay." And I thought my sponsor was going to talk to me about Jesus Christ. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's where I was. I was like, "I'm," but I what if like you like. He was Jewish, but never mind. So like, it probably wasn't going to come up. Um, but but I was really worried he's going to you know talk to me about this. And he says, okay, so crack open the book, and you know, and he's talking about like, okay, the phenomena of craving, the allergy, right? If you ever read the doctor's opinion, I was like, eh, okay, whatever. And so I'm li- kind of listening to him. And he, you guys know that 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 Gary Larson comes in where it's like blah 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 ginger, blah 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 blah, and he's just talking about blah 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 blah. <coughs> and then he comes across this and he says, you know, hmm. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Hang on, right, hang on, stop right there. Read that to me again. He said, "Alcoholics drink because they, or men and women drink because they like the effect produced by alcohol." Wow. Never even thought about that. Like, why did I drink? So I like the way I feel. Cool. Okay. Go on. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, right, like bloody hands, for example. They cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false breakdowns on Bart. On Bart. Yeah. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. Everybody punches holes in walls. Okay. They are restless, irritable, and discontent. It's like, oh, man, where did you guys come up with that? How did you? Restless, irritable, and discontent. Right? <laughs> and that was me. And, you know, I, I think, my opinion, um, and what I've seen is like different parts of the program. I, I, I call them kind of milestones, but different parts of the program, whether it's steps, speakers, fellowship, whatever. But there's something there that cements it, us or that keeps us in a chair when kind of like, I, I, I like vodka. <laughs> right? I do. Um, but there's something in here that. That keeps me, and what it is, is it stuff like that, right? Because it tells me that I like the effect produced by drinking, but I can't do it safely, right? So again, this program is conditional, right? I can drink all I want, I just can't do it safely. And I have enough evidence to where I said, yeah, that's true. It's true for me. I don't drink safely. Okay, knucklehead, don't drink. So, the doctor's opinion, and there's a reason, again, if you know Bill Wilson, like, his story comes after the doctor's opinion. Bill Wilson was not a shy and retiring person. He did not see ground graciously. But he thought it was so important to put Dr. Silkworth's um, preface in front of his own story that that actually leads it. The other thing I love about the doctor's opinion, and this was, I, this is where I was when I came into the program, is it doesn't ever mention the word God. It talks about a psychic change. And that, to me, was a lot more palatable when I came in. Because my psyche was all screwed up. Like, I could sign off on, you guys said, like, hey, you need to change your thinking. You need a psychic change. But if you would have told me, like, I need all of this God stuff, right? <laughs> right now, I can tell you, and I, in quick order, came to understand that, like, God is the most important thing in my life. Full stop. No conditions. No explanations. It is. That said, I don't even know what God is. Like, I have less of an idea now than I did 18 years ago. That's my experience. But I know God is this. All I got to do is remember the trajectory of my hand, vodka, telephone, call for help. That's not me. How's this happening? And everything else followed. That was a moment of grace, you know, and it tells me in the big book, it says we are, we get sober, we are get sober by circumstance rather than virtue. And that's something that I hold on to, right? Because I didn't do anything to get that gift of sobriety, right? I just, I'm a dumb kid who made a lot of mistakes and burned a lot of people, did a lot of stupid things, you know, and I still get to be sober and have this great life. Just by doing a couple simple steps. By talking about some stuff that maybe I don't actually really want to talk about. I'd rather not, you know? 
But in the end, like, if that's the trade-off, I'll take that trade every single day. If I have to write some stuff because I'm so angry at my wife, my boss, whatever, whoever, you know, some random person on the street, if I have to write about that and do an inventory about that, rather than just saying, oh, yeah, because that solves it in the moment, and the next thing I know, I'm in Mexico <laughs> with a bunch of hookers and a bunch of blow. But you got something crawling on you. Yeah. Okay, you know that. All right. <laughs> Scared. <me>. Sorry. <laughs> it's just a little animal up here. Um, uh, but you know, like we can't, we can't, we can't drink safely, right? I can't drink safely. I'll speak for myself. I can't drink safely. You know, and that's been my experience. And so, the real simple thing is, is well, just don't drink. Um, and I, that's what I needed to hear. You know, that's what I needed for you guys when I came here. Is like, just don't drink. And here's how. The first 164 pages lay out exactly, tells us me in the preface, it tells me precisely how we have recovered from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Precisely. Like, you know, they toss around a lot of modifiers in the big book. Rigorous honesty. I'll settle for honesty. But no, you got to be rigorously honest. You got to, you know, we're going to show you precisely. And that's been my experience because I have recovered. Like Liz said, you know, during hers, like, I don't ever look at a shot glass and, like, elbow my eight-year-old out of the way to grab it. (laughs) So that's recovery right there, you know, because I would have. Or, like, yeah, good night, honey. I'm going to just go for a walk. And you know where I was going. (laughs) And she's, oh, sweet, sure, great. Go stretch your legs. Go enjoy the night air. I'm like, no, no, I'm going to a dank, dingy place, and I'm going to get fucked (laughs) up. Because that's the kind of stuff I do, you know, without this program. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, if you're new and you don't understand the program like like me, um, I don't see anybody crying here tonight. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe uh, I shouldn't have brought that up. Uh, but, you know, listen for the similarities. Um, you know, if you got arrested in Bulgaria. Anybody? Uh, okay. So listen for the similarities. But, I mean, the similarity is, is we all have a program. You know, the difference is, is do you do the work? You know, because we have a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. That's the condition, right? I either am working the program or I'm not. And, and for me, I'm a binary person. Like, I'm either getting closer to God or I'm getting closer to drink. You know, and, and, you know, maybe that's too rudimentary. Maybe that's too coarse and brute force or whatever. But for me, it helps simplify something. Before I take an action, I never, this is, wow, never even imagined this. I could actually think, like, is this going to get me closer to God and my fellows? Or is this going to get me closer to drink? You know, and that's sometimes the criteria, Right. But again, all this stuff, you know, I came in here not knowing a single thing about 12 steps. Not a single thing. Um, And somehow, like, I've learned a few things, and most important, I haven't had to take a journey since my first meeting. I mean, if that, I mean, if program can work for me, you know, trust me, it can work for everybody, because... I was going to think this program through and kind of figure it out and then, you know, do what I needed to do and get on with my life. Um, and you guys told me, yeah, you know what, actually sobriety is life, you know. And I got to say, man, my, my life doesn't look anything like I thought it was going to look like. Um, they talk about, you know, having life beyond your wildest dreams. Like, I didn't dream about having a mortgage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Certainly never dreamed about, like, having, uh, having a wife who's never seen me drunk. You know, kid who's never seen your dad fall down the stairs because he's shit faced. You know? It's never happened to me. Maybe it'll happen tonight. You know? But as long as I stay to the program, as long as I do the 12 steps, stay engaged with you guys, come to meetings, you know, and most important, keep my connection to God. Um, it's probably not going to happen tonight. So. Um, and I got a meeting go to tomorrow, so uh, I should be okay. So thanks, thanks for having me out tonight, guys. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.